and I'm also the creative director of the Institute for Human Activity, which is a new research institution. It's an, an, uh, an art center in a way. And we have only one program so far, and this program aims to make critical art lucrative for the poor. And to do that, um, we are in the process of establishing uh, the gentrification of a little piece of Congolese rainforest. We are trying to gentrify uh, yeah, a little area in a five-year program, so in a way it's a, a good old five-year economic program. Um, but first I should probably give you a little bit of background. I would like to talk just slightly about a problem I perceive in much of the dominant critical interventionist art um, that we see in biennials, festivals, uh, museums, etc. Um, it seems to me that this type of art, art that deals with income equality, with colonialism, with precarity, with, uh, uh, with all these very pressing and urgent social issues, um, an art type that is very dominant these days, and that is mostly made by either Western artists or Western-based artists, it seems to me that in the production of this art, there is a gap. On the one hand, in the places of intervention, the places where the artist goes out and films something or shows uh, some inequality or highlights something or stages a, a beautiful collaborative project or whatever it may be. Um, so in the places of intervention, uh, the material impact of that work seems to be quite limited. <laughs> yes, it may have a very important immaterial impact. People may, um, you know, have new ideas or feel have a feeling of togetherness or uh, God knows what they're feeling. It may be very positive, but the material impact seems to be very limited. However, in the places of reception of such art, in the places where these pieces are subsequently shown, discussed, distrib distributed, publicized, talked about, there is also this immaterial impact. We all get a lot of good ideas, uh, for example, here. But there is also a very, very pressing and real material impact. To give you, uh, to, to make it a little bit more clear, we all know that biennials and art festivals and film festivals aren't really funded because the city governments or private uh, donors hope that these biennials and festivals will radicalize the world. They do it mostly because they know or hope that staging events like these uh, creates an attractive climate for tourists, for investors, for uh, business people. Um, they do it to put their cities on the global map. So it seems that, again, in the places of intervention, which may be, I don't know, in Peru or in Mumbai or in the outskirts of Paris, the, the impact is largely confined to something immaterial, to symbolism, let's say, whereas the impact to the centers of reception, mostly cities in, let's say, the global west, there is a real hard cash impact because of this critical art. So if you look at it, it's symbolism for the poor and hard cash for the rich. This is a division between labor and profits within this art world, critical art world setup that seems to be very, very similar to the division between labor and profits in other globalized industries. There is the same. So even while much of this critical art can give us images of beauty, of resistance, of kindness, and however inspiring and good and necessary that is, more often than not, and obviously there are many exa exceptions, and we've certainly seen some of these exceptions, but more often than not, it creates some kind of a beautiful exception to the status quo. A beautiful exception that is then consumed for a group by a group of people and produced for a group of people that in their own lives already live the beautiful exception. <laughs> Now, this whole phenomena of you know, art and capital and how it relates, uh, the fact that critical art um, has this tendency to accumulate capital or to attract it or to 
in one way or the other make an attractive investment climate, that's not just a side effect. It's not something that uh, came there by accident. This is something that is very deliberately used and speculated upon. And of course, the shorthand for this phenomenon is the word gentrification. Now, I'm sure you know of the word, but just very briefly, <clears throat> the, the, the most famous example of it certainly is New York City in the early 80s when large stretches of the city were um, economically unproductive, the Lower East Side for example, uh, you, you had just poor immigrants living there who didn't pay taxes and who, you know, it, it was just an eyesore to investors and to the city of New York. And they very deliberately then gave studio spaces for free or for very little money to young, mostly white, male artists. And at the time, um, yeah, and this really worked, I should say, you know, five years later there were nice cappuccino bars and, and boutique, designer boutique uh, stores, and then ten years later none of these artists could still pay the rent, they were pushed out, and, and of course the poor immigrants that lived there in the first place were already pushed out even before that. But in economic terms it really, really worked. Uh, an area that paid no taxes and nobody wanted to go to, all of a sudden became a very hot spot for you know, designer boutiques. And if you go to New York, these are the places you will go and visit. <laughs> so, even if it's true that many artists are very much against these, um, uh, these developments and this, let's say, instrumentalization of art for capital gain, even if many artists are against it, we all travel the global hubs from one to the other that are the living evidence of, of this very theory. I mean, I came from New York, now I'm here in the center of Copenhagen. The last talk I did was in Mitte in Berlin. I travel the hubs, that, and, and it's true for many of the people here, that are the liver, living um, evidence of it, however much I may be against it. So whether art is critical or not, in many ways it functions in exactly the same way. Uh, it, 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 it basically is there in a broader scheme of things. In the Western world it's there to allow cities to brand themselves. So even if art may take a very critical stance on all these global issues, it is more often than not sponsored and financed and made possible by the very institutions and individuals whose policies we try to then change through this art, but it's funded by the very same people. So many would claim, or some prominent critics claim, that the political claims of much of this contemporary art and activism that operates within the art world is uh, fraudulent. So if I resume, there seems to be this gap. Um, capital accumulation seems to be art's main intervention in social reality. Much art and many artists doesn't seem to be aware of it, or uh, they don't choose not to deal with it. And in the end, what it creates are beautiful exceptions for an audience that in and of itself already lives the beautiful exception. We then, of course, can feel very paralyzed by this. I certainly have been feeling very paralyzed by this. Uh, but then, with a few friends, I founded this Institute for Human Activities with our five-year gentrification program in the Congolese rainforest. And what we try to do is to radically accept that capital accumulation is art's main effect in social reality. We, don't, we do not want to treat it as some unwanted side effect, like something we hadn't thought about, like, oh, I just wanted to be critical, uh, the fact that in the end this is going to sell cappuccinos in Berlin Mitte or in the Lower East Side of New York, I just didn't think about that, that's, you know, we can't afford to do that. We decided to make this capital accumulation uh, effect of art as the core of what we, of our artistic intervention. We, as artists, should take ownership over it. We can't afford to have the main effect of criticality to be managed by real estate investors or politicians. So, capital accumulation, much like brush or a paint, should be our medium. It's our tool for intervention. So how do we create capital in a place that really needs a little bit of capital? Again, a little piece of Congolese rainforest, I'll talk about it later. 
How do we accumulate capital there? Well, obviously by building a research center for criticality. So we create a site where in an in vitro setting, a test setting, we somehow mimic the economics and we try to imagine how the political impact of art can be constructed, how it can be reimagined, given the fact that art is alre always already co-opted by capital. And that, of course, is our gentrification program. We do all this on a former, um, on, a, on a palm oil plantation uh, in the Congo. I'll, I'll give you a, a tiny bit of information more later. Um, people in these plantations are really very, very poor. Chances that uh, somebody working on these plantations would be able to send even one of their children to primary school are next to zero. Um, and we had our opening seminar there. We did an opening seminar one year ago. And we tried to bring together uh, all the parameters that in the end would define our project. So we had activists, um, some of the most vocal ones of, of the Congo, and economists and uh, art historians, some of them coming from Berlin and New York, and obviously many people who, who live in this area and who uh, really want things to change. Um, let's, I, I would like to, one second still, but I, would, I think I'll show you uh, just one clip of this opening seminar and I'll just tell you the guy that speaks is this Canadian economist that we all love to dislike. His name is Richard Florida. He is the inventor of this creative class theory. Uh, which basically says, well, if you want to make your city grow, just put an art museum, because that's what's going to make it economically viable. Let's look at the clip. Uh, when I said we were at the end of a scheduled talk and he had many other talks to do, the man flies around the world to cities like Copenhagen and any city that wants to become a creative city and therefore wants to be, you know, go become a more attractive place for investment, invites this guy. So I thought it was kind of sad to reserve that type of knowledge, how, how art can, you know, be, attract capital, to reserve that knowledge to the places of reception, places like this one. We should probably transfer that knowledge to the places of intervention, the place where the things that we want to critique are uh, actually take place. That's why I invited him and paid loads of money to, to have him as part of our opening seminar. We did our test run on, as I said earlier maybe, or it was in the clip, on a plantation formerly owned by Unilever. Uh, you may know Unilever, it's a very big um, uh, consumer goods company, one of the biggest companies in this world. Um, and on these plantations that I founded some 100 years ago, as I said earlier, uh, chances that your children would be able to go to school are next to zero. And, you know, child mortality, I'm not going to talk about the details, but you really would not want a job there. Anyway, Unilever is not only known for its large-scale plantations in the Congo, but also for its very generous funding of the arts. Most notably at Tate Modern in London, for the last 10 years it has been funding very famous and very critical artists such as Bruce Nauman and uh, Ai Weiwei, and um, the last and latest installment was a fantastic piece by Tino Segal. So, it's kind of good to try and then build some type of creative center on one of their former plantations. So we're building this hub for you know, critical art formulation, how to deal with immaterial labor, with post fortist labor conditions, with precarity, with our own complicity with the economic system that we live in. And we think that it may be a place where we can reformulate what activism and what art may be, confronted, if we are confronted with the fact that we are constantly materially supported by about half of the world population that works for us for free. Um, you saw in the end of the clip, uh, the beginning of the program, really creative therapy. We do that uh, with, um, we hired some quite, yeah, very good creative therapist, an Israeli guy who does this after tsunamis and earthquakes and terrorist attacks. So we invited him to come 
launch a program like that with the people who have been uh, operating, let's say, for 100 years in this um, tropical agriculture scheme. Um, we're building a residency program. Uh, you know, we work with many artists, etc., and obviously with the plantation workers themselves. And again, it's on this Unilever plantation, and we start this program for criticality not because we believe critique will really change reality, but because we do know critique attracts capital, yeah, and capital is what they need. And understanding all that will then possibly urge us to reformulate our game, how critique can again be formulated given the fact that it is already co-opted. So imagine that in a few years' time, um, some of this artwork made in collaborative projects with the local population um, uh, that we, I exhibited here, or the institute exhibited here, and some plantation worker makes a drawing. He typically makes, let's say, 10 or 20 dollars a month, or euros a month, or, I don't know, 200 kroner per month. What if he makes a drawing about the fact that he makes 200 kroner work a, a month, and we sell that drawing here to you? then, you know, he could uh, make in one day two or three years worth of uh, plantation labor. And that would be quite novel, because then critique on Congolese labor conditions would actually have an impact on Congolese labor conditions. We're not going to continue our program on the place where we did this opening seminar. It's quite telling that the Canadian company that bought over this Unilever plantation pushed us out this summer at gunpoint. Um, making critique lucrative for the poor is not as innocent as it may sound here from my talk. Um, but still, we're moving elsewhere, <laughs> a little bit further down the river. Uh, and we do think that critique and critical art will diversify the economy, create products with higher added value, and then, as I said, a critical Critical engagement with labor conditions will bring food in the table, and that's obviously what people need, something to eat. If it really goes well, in five years' time, we will be discussing on the plantation the merits of criticality over cappuccinos, as we do here, or if it really goes well with dairy-free soy lattes. Thank you. Genial. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And answer questions, I'm sure. Uh, that will be one quick question sure. for me. Oh, and it's a very um, naive question. I love this. Yeah. Does it work? You say that you are thrown out at gunpoint. Yeah. Will this? I mean, Africa is huge. The world is a troubled place. Yeah. Well, that's what we all want to deal with, no? With the troubled places of this world. And I, I think embracing the, f the fact that we live in this capitalist world um, may urge us to reformulate what really critique should be. And I think it was quite telling that people there just want food on the table. If I... what's that? It's what you talk about. That's true. <laughs> yeah. But it will work, for certain it will work, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, I don't want to die for it, but I certainly want to live for it, yeah. I'm spending many years on this thing, and many people are doing it with me. And uh, let's say the, the, the urgency and the enthusiasm of our partners, which is mostly these plantation workers, is, uh, is very, very high, yeah. And so thank you very much. Things are turning in on themselves here.